good morning. Thank you all for being here at the CRO International Panel event. I would like to introduce Luis Sanz, the Director General of the International Association of Science Parks and Areas of Innovation, ISP, who will be opening the event and saying a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Thank you, everyone, physically present in this uh, auditorium, but also on live streaming, wherever you may be listening to us. Thanks for your presence. So indeed, this is the final event of a uh, over two year program, which a number of partners put together for a very clear reason. There is an increasing demand of developing better and new skills so that our companies in Europe and elsewhere for that matter, but basically in Europe can successfully and with guarantees of efficiency uh, face their new inter internationalization processes, which is indeed uh, a trend unstoppable is being noticed uh, not only by many social researchers but also by many practitioners and by statistics hither and thither that tell us that indeed internationalization is more than ever before an absolute need without which uh, success and even survival cannot be uh, cannot be achieved so many of the partners involved in this process are somehow intermediary organizations, whether they are chambers of commerce, science, technology parks, business incubators, of course, universities, uh, which, among other things, have to check which are the tools and the skills they are able to supply and to provide to our companies, and especially SMEs, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Because these are the ones that, on the first uh, instance, suffer the impact of an increasing internationalization, uh, which brings a number of opportunities, but just as big a number of uh, challenges that must be addressed. So we did feel the need of uh, digging a bit into what is it that we do to uh, facilitate their job, to provide better skills, and to provide new tools. And that, is, that, that has been the target of this Grow International uh, project that, as you probably know, has been funded by the lifelong uh, learning program within the Leonardo da Vinci Transfer of Innovation Frame programs of the European Commission, to which, of course, we are wholeheartedly thankful. So I, I won't take much more of your time. I would only like to uh, announce that due to a number of logistic difficulties, there may, be, there may be some changes in the program, although I see now that some of the speakers that were missing have finally, thank God, arrived. So uh, I'm just going to conclude wishing you a good seminar and hoping that what you will hear will uh, encourage you to pursue the role of internationalization and to develop new better skills and competences. Thank you again for your presence. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis. Uh, <clears throat> now, first session uh, will cover the process of internationalization of SMEs and how to make this goal more achievable. I will welcome back Luis Sanz, who will be reflecting on why becoming global-minded is so important. It's me again, and indeed I will try to share with you a number of uh, thoughts and reflections regarding the overall phenomenon of internationalization, which is a phenomenon that I have personally been observing with great attention for the last number of years because my professional field has to do pretty much precisely with that. I'm leading uh, a global association with members in 73 uh, countries. And uh, the members of our association have as a main objective to provide a number of added value services next to, of course, adequate spaces so that companies can be more competitive 
in this new realm of uh, global competition. So what I intend to do is to provide something that hopefully will serve as a, an overall frame or introduction to the presentations more to the point, I'm guessing, that will come uh, later on. And I chose to talk about the global mindset because I think it's a good starting point. Uh, maybe because of my background as a sociologist, I uh, am prone to consider many of these processes uh, from a very broad perspective. And what it really triggers my personal interest here is the individual and psychological aspects that are embedded in uh, the construction of this new world and even more so how we as individuals and as a next step organizations fit uh, adequately in this new world. There are many adjustments that need to be made and many of them are not just mechanical or organizational. They are cultural on the one hand and they are psychological on the other hand. And unless one keeps in mind this uh, broad picture, the risk of missing some important points and addressing this issue from a strictly uh, technical, uh, mechanical and empirical uh, way may produce perhaps undesired results. Uh, first things first, I want to uh, take just a few seconds to thank the partners that have been with us along these two years of Grow International. You have the list on the screen, but it's nice to check that we have partners from Portugal, Spain, Germany, Italy and France. So uh, we've tried to put together our respective experiences and try to extract from them whatever could be useful in order to propose to uh, companies and to intermediary organizations new ways to advance into the internationalization processes. So here are some basic thoughts, but let me first put on my glasses, otherwise I'm lost. Uh, I think it's worthwhile to just pay attention to uh, a number of issues. Some of them are well known, but perhaps we have to anchor them in our minds before moving forward. One is that we're not discussing here anymore a matter of choice. In uh, the new uh, economic prospects, and especially when we are talking about new companies being created or relatively young companies uh, going through a stage of uh, maturation, evolution and expansion, the issue of internationalization is an absolute must. There's no free choice left for us. We have to undergo that road. And it is true, however, that it is probably right to assert that these processes can be observed either more intensely or in a more sophisticated way in companies that we can recognize as mostly being innovation-based companies rather than more traditional-based companies. Although this has to be uh, said with uh, with some caution, because in fact we know that many, let's call them traditional industries, have a high degree of internationalization. The problem, or the issue rather than the problem, the issue is that this internationalization of many of these traditional industries is pretty partial and somehow obsolete in the way they approach it, as we will see uh, later on. The second observation is that obviously for SMEs and moreover for startups, engaging into this sort of uh, process of becoming truly international is difficult and it's costly. And obviously those are the type of companies that will require more support from organizations like uh, the ones that we represent here. The big multinationals do not really need us for that. They have their own tools, they have their own immense budgets, and many of them have been international or multinational for a number of years already. But the issue of the new companies that we are creating in our incubators, hosting in our science parks, encouraging in our universities, 
whenever we are talking of universities that are involved in these type of processes. That's a completely different story. And so it is our duty to think and to consider which are the things that we can do for them in this respect. Of course, I don't think I have to go any farther to just call you, your attention upon the fact that the recent economic crisis, one of the many, and there are others to come, has indeed uh, given a boost to the internationalization of many of our companies who thought and who realized that with local or domestic markets practically collapsing, going out was an absolute need. So we have indeed statistically seen a growth of these internationalization processes in many of our companies. And in fact, some of the companies that were happy enough with selling their products and services in the nearby, uh, nearby domestic markets have now become exporters, have joined efforts and, 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 uh, and money and plans with companies elsewhere in order to make joint ventures, in order to arrive uh, to uh, convenient merging processes or to established strategic alliances and so on and so forth. And the final consideration to start with is that the, classic, uh, the classical internationalization processes that we have known so far have become obsolete in practically a very short time. They've, be they've been going on for a couple of decades or even, even more than that, but all of a sudden we realize that many of them are obsolete, not in the sense that they are no longer valid at all, but in the sense that they are no longer valid for many of the newer companies that, as a matter of fact, do constitute uh, the core concern of intermediary organizations like ours. With all these things in mind, perhaps we want to establish the first distinction because we can be talking of the internationalization of goods and products, internationalization of services, and, and this is something I would like to add because I haven't, I haven't seen it reflected very much in, in literature, but I think it's there and I think it's of the utmost importance, what I would call the internationalization of people, or if you prefer, the global mindset. And there are different types of internationalization, if I may say so. When talking about products, which is pretty much how the whole thing started, <coughs> uh, we of course realized that the traditional patterns based on import and export of goods are still there. And of course they amount for a substantial part in terms of money of what the internationalization processes uh, account for. But for starters, they are becoming much more, let's call it, multilateral. Because the complexity of this process has it made so that finan financial institutions, such, such as banks, for example, are now getting much more directly involved and much more hands-on involved together with the industries that are exporting. So they take part by financing certain operations, but, but sometimes they liaise the result of the operation to the eventual uh, reward. So they are more actively uh, involved in these processes and not just being there backing with financial muscle the needs of companies. There is another interesting issue that begins to change the whole shape and the whole phase of these products internationalization. And it's the fact that many of the products that we are seeing around us are international ab initio, ab obo, since the very beginning simply because many of the components of many of the products that are being circulated around the world have been manufactured and designed in many different countries. So somehow the essence of the product has suddenly become international. And it is no surprise, therefore, that if even the core of the product is international, anything else that comes around the product, including its commercialization and its traveling around the world is also increasingly international. And yet again, this whole process is becoming increasingly complex and increasingly sophisticated. It's not enough just to have a relatively good and more or less cheap product and know somebody in a third country that will find some customers for you and there you go, you put it in a container and you send it and if you're lucky you get your money and the, the thing uh, goes on. Now, 
you have to engage in a different previous processes, quality certifications like the ISOs, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we are somehow uh, facing a completely new reality when it comes to discussing the internationalization of products, which is going far beyond the mere traditional import-export. And the last reflection that I wanted to make with you is that, and I think we all have this experience, even as consumers, we are entering in the face of made-in-the-world products. So the made in China or made in Spain or made in Europe is now being put under severe scrutiny, if I may say so. Precisely because of what I said before. Products are designed somewhere else, assembled in another country, moved by a third party. Let me just put an example that I think we all somehow may have experienced. And because this affects, I'm, I'm jumping now, introducing my next slide when we when we we'll talk about services, it affects the world of services too. Those of you who travel by plane, which I assume is everybody, probably have realized that now it is very difficult to know who is really responsible for you traveling. Because you buy a ticket and you think that you are buying the ticket from Air France, and maybe you're buying the ticket from Air France, but then you go to your plane and it's no longer an Air France, Air France plane, it's another company's plane because there is this sort of combined shared flight. But then it happens to be also that this plane may have been rented to another third company. The crew comes from Ukraine and uh, the taxes of the airport are handled by a completely separate company. And at the end, if something goes wrong and you have to complain, you no longer know to who the hell you have to complain. Uh, this is the dark side of these aspects. Of course, there are good sides to it too. But what I intended to underline is the fact that the products have become a mingle of nationalities, of cultures, of business regulations, of different laws that are determining the fate of the product and together with the fate of the product, the fate of the companies involved in manufacturing and providing this product and the fate of us as customers and consumers, which have to adapt to this whole new game and to these whole new sets of rules that are completely new for many of us. Uh, and uh, this, is just, this is just to keep in mind what has been until now the typical process. This is often referred to as the U model, but which starts when talking about the traditional internationalization of products a traditional industry started typically either by non-exporting and only then when you reach a certain stage of maturity you begin to have some sporadic once in a while exports via external representatives without having your own structure abroad whatsoever. Then if things go well you move on and you may consider establishing a more permanent sales subsidiary abroad and then finally you may even determine to go elsewhere and to manu manufacture your products as elsewhere so that they are closer to your end market. And as I said before, this type of approach has been completely turned upside down in many cases. As we see when we move to talk a, li a little bit about the internationalization of services, which for starters, we have to say that it has already surpassed the internationalization of products and of the secondary sector in many countries. And there's a still a growth uh, potential uh, that we can detect uh, when it comes to internationalizing services. Of course, that's another game too, because in many cases, we cannot wait or measure the deliverables of uh, what we are selling abroad. And in most of these services, or at least in many of them, the, the intangible components are much more uh, important than in the industrial products. This introduces uh, naturally some challenges that we will eventually have to address in a better way than we are doing it now. Companies whose main activity and whose main product is services are probably more eager than industrial companies in establishing this type of international deals. Let me, let me turn that, let me rephrase it. We also see that it is often the case that 
services companies are more have a greater global mindset already in them than industrial companies. And I don't, want, I don't have the time nor the inclination to enter now into explaining why it is that, but I think that not only by facts, but even by intuition, we can conclude that that is the case. Of course, all this new world of the application, the apps, and so on and so forth, pretty, pretty much based on uh, IT technologies, have even given a further boost to the creation of companies that are dealing with services, because that's the typical issue that can be a hybrid between service and a product, if you like. Uh, but they are, since the very beginning of their inception, already born with an international and a global idea in their DNA. And last feature, they are by far much more human intensive and highly, highly dependent on cultural adaptation and on the uh, type of subsidiary branches that you may like to establish abroad or the type of alliances that you may like to engage in. There are a number of theories. Uh, if you're interested in analyzing these processes from the academic point of view, there are many, many theories around the world and plenty of literature. I just mentioned a few of them that are, uh, let's say, relatively well known. But perhaps uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, invite you is to reflect about this new third element that I mentioned before, is the internationalization of people or the internationalization of the mindsets, if you like. So in this sort of wheel there, whatever you start will bring you spinning around to any other of these concepts. Because what we are facing now is that, of course, there is this new IT-based global culture. We can see it even in, 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 in our youngsters. Together with a staggering uh, phenomenon of increasing speed and acceleration. In fact, as I, as I tend to often say, the real problem is not speed, because we can adapt to speed. The problem is that we don't even have the time to adapt, because the speed is increased constantly. So the acceleration of everything, not only economically speaking, but also socially speaking and politically speaking, is definitely breathtaking. It takes a great effort from societies, but certainly also from individuals, to be able to give yourself the necessary tools to cope with that without going crazy at a certain point in your life. Just think about the exponential increase in terms of training and learning opportunities that we can see online and on the internet. All these tutorials in YouTube, all these online courses, there are really countless. Of course, in this huge legion of them, there are some some of them are very good, top quality, some of them are just uh, uh, lousy products, but they are there. And many, many people by the millions are making increasing use of them. And then that also means that the language skills can be much easily and much more easily acquired than they used to be in generations before. Traveling has made easy, available, and let's say has been completely or almost completely democratized. It's just... Uh, when you travel now, you realize that, for example, uh, let's say 10 years ago, you couldn't find more than seven, 10 people on business class in a flight. Now you count them by the hundreds. I don't know what happened with business class. I, it has become too cheap, or uh, there is something wrong there, because, <laughs> because it's really now practically no difference, except in the, that you get an extra sandwich uh, if, you, if you travel business class. Uh, this new IT-based culture has also multiplied exponentially the possibility of increasing your own personal networks, which affect your personal life, your personal hobbies and interests, but of course also your professional life. And uh, that also means that many young people all of a sudden have a plethora of new role models to look upon and to say, I want to do that. If that guy could do that company or, or create that product or organize that venture, I'm going to be able to do that too. So this stimuli made by these newer, maybe virtual, but still accessible role models plays also a determining role in changing the way we relate to the world. And that could not but have an enormous impact in the way 
that many new companies are being created since day one. And that is why we very often, more and more so, talk about the global-born company or the micro-multinationals. These are not just fancy names, these are names that are reflecting an increasing reality. Now, what we normally mean by that is that many of these companies are already born either by people who have a vast international experience, completely unfathomable if you were thinking of their parents or their grandparents. They could have never dreamed that such, thing, such things were possible. Now they are possible. Or else, because the, many of these companies even are created by people that come already from different countries and different cultures. So the number of companies that are emerging in many parts of the world funded by an Indian and an American, a Russian and a French guy, a German, and because they people meet, they actually meet in these new nodes or areas of innovation that are becoming serious, heavy poles of attraction of new, of new talent. Which would lead us to another problem that is not what we came to discuss here today, but it's perhaps, it, it, it's perhaps good to mention. Of course, there are certain countries and certain cities, more than countries, that happen to be extremely attractive for this kind of people, for the, for the new creative class, for the young, talented, skillful, technically oriented, with a great global mindset uh, people. Whereas other cities are less attractive for that. Now, this is not new. There's always been cities that are more attractive than other cities. But when cities discuss how to engage into these processes and how to be on the leading edge of innovation, they will have to address many of these issues too. Uh, as you know, there are a number of studies, I can mention the ones by Richard Florida and a few others that are trying to establish a direct connection between openness, tolerance, cultural activities, and the capacity of being attractive to this type of new uh, young, skillful, talented, knowledge workers, if I may say so. Of course, these new type of companies demand new services, demand a whole new concept of space that has to be provided by them. And that is, for example, why many of the, of the more classical science and technology parks, and I'm talking now about the industry of which I am a proponent of, uh, realize that they have a new competitor. There is a new kid in the block. And those are the downtown areas full of fully internet equipped cafes with practically no rules except be yourself and get your business going. So this complete new nonchalant approach to things, much more informal approach to things, is now becoming a huge competitor of parks that are adapting in some cases, otherwise they will go definitely down the drain. And that is why we are talking now more of areas of innovation as the next step in the evolution of science and technology park than of the classical park uh, itself. But again, I'm getting a bit way off our mark today. So, what we have, and I'm reaching my uh, end. We're facing a brave new world, if I may use the literary expression, where where we have detected the, the, these new personalities, these new characters that I uh, have coined with the name Globopolitans. Now, I don't know whether this coinage will be successful or not, but I think it, it hits the point. This is people that have, of course, local roots. We are not talking about eradicated or de-eradicated people, but they have a constant great window ahead of them that enables them to look at the whole world. They have contacts, they know how to behave, I mean their, their culture is already more global. Uh, what I'm talking here is that it's not just enough to learn a couple of foreign languages to be a global polyton. You have to really develop that personality by which you feel comfortable in other cultures other than your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, all this means that whereas you have an enormous bigger amount of opportunities for whatever businesses you may be developing, you also have an enormous more nearby competition because your competitors are also here 
through the internet, through these type of new technologies, they are only seconds away from what it used to be your own little night protected privileged domestic market. And that is no longer the case. So opportunities are of course matched with challenges and dangers. And our challenge is to develop tools and skills and perhaps I dare say an attitude, an overall attitude uh, to provide our young people, our young entrepreneurs with this type of sense. And I don't have to explain how important education since very early stages uh, is for all these processes to be successful. So these are the main elements that I wanted to share with you, hoping that they may constitute a frame for the further discussions of this seminar. I conclude here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your insights. Uh, next speaker is Roberto Santolamazza, Managing Director for Technology uh, T2I. Trasferimento Tecnologico Innovazione, who will be sharing his thoughts on the importance of innovation in the internationalization process. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. My name is uh, Roberto Santolamazza. I'm the managing director of uh, uh, T2I, that is uh, an innovation agency. I have uh, some information uh, on uh, our organization that have been uh, uh, w with the pleasure working together with the other organization that uh, were named uh, just before. In, uh, in the Grow International project. And uh, what I want to share uh, as an innovation agency uh, are basically some uh, uh, of the major trends on innovation that uh, we really uh, experiment on the field, uh, on, on our daily work, uh, visiting companies. And you know well that uh, uh, this is something that is very true for all Europe, but in particular in Italy, 99% of companies are uh, small and medium enterprises. I would say, I'd rather say more small than medium. So, uh, we are an innovation agency and we are also a research body because basically we uh, uh, both uh, just technical expertise and we try to uh, face a very challenging uh, question about the, how to support uh, small companies in the innovation process. But um, the, the basic assumption that I want to show and share with you is that uh, internationalization, as has been already showed in the, in the, in the previous uh, speech, and innovation are, are more and more uh, synonymous because uh, innovation has a lot to do nowadays with uh, uh, internationalization of knowledges, of technologies, of markets, and uh, the um, classical, let's say, uh, division of these two topics uh, in which internationalization was uh, just selling abroad uh, or be present on uh, foreign markets and uh, innovation was about uh, just uh, uh, innovate your products uh, uh, within your uh, workshop uh, is uh, uh, no rather true. So uh, I will not go through any, any points and I will leave uh, obviously this material. Uh, I want to say that just uh, uh, some other information about our uh, organization that uh, is the, the largest in the Venice region, that is named uh, Veneto, that uh, is based in, uh, in the northeastern Italy. 
and uh, we are more than uh, 50 people and uh, we are very active also in the um, research and development innovation uh, um, EU program for example like uh, Horizon 2020 and this is something uh, if you want uh, very uh, specific but uh, another branch of internationalization because uh, helping small companies entering Horizon 2020 programs, for example, is uh, helping them to uh, not only uh, get in a grant, but entering in an international consortium, working in a foreign language, uh, uh, working with the foreign partners and uh, on an innovation project. And this is also a good example of uh, how these uh, policies also can help the, this kind of uh, internationalization. Oh, here you have some uh, figures about us. Uh, you see that uh, we, are, uh, we have a, a rather large uh, base of customers that are in, in based basically in the northeastern of Italy, but uh, in, to some extent also uh, on a national level. And uh, we have four locations. Uh, some of you uh, visited the Treviso headquarters, but we have also uh, other two locations of laboratories. And uh, uh, I was uh, very positively impressed by a remark that has been made uh, in the previous speech about the certification process. In many cases, uh, certification is something that means basically your products, your service is compliant to an international standards is conceived as a, you know, something bureaucratic. But this is uh, less and less uh, true because uh, if you want to be present on markets, you have also to design your, pro your product to be compliant to the uh, current and uh, the future standards. Hmm? And uh, the uh, unbelievable to me or huge uh, scandal about the Volkswagen is a good example how a multinational was late in, be comply in being compliant to an international standards and try to find out, uh, let's say, a, a different way to, to get there because they, it's really a, a lack in the development process. And, uh, and this tells you that even multinational companies can be late or wanted to enter a specific market like the US market, uh, they uh, even invested in a tricky way to, to get certificated. Hmm? But, uh, and I say this, and I want to point out this because uh, uh, on international standards, we are very keen on this. We are the uh, biggest uh, uh, uni office in Italy. UNI is the Italian uh, Organization for Standards, so the part, uh, the Italian, uh, let's say, declination of uh, ISO, the International Standard Organization, and we provide uh, thousands of hours in uh, helping companies understanding the importance, the relevance of uh, uh, standards to, uh, and also the future standards uh, to be competitive. And uh, also we have... Um, the Oderzo uh, seat is a technical seat with the laboratories uh, certified at the European level in several uh, industries to test and uh, get the, for example, CE marking for your products. So we try also to give the service uh, and to have the infrastructure to support them. Yeah, basically our services uh, are organized along an ideal new, new product uh, or service uh, introduction process. You see from the very beginning of ideation and uh, conceiving of a new product to, through the testing, the engineering, the um, ideation. Uh, here another crucial point is the uh, intellectual property. I will say something about this just to say that we are also patent library office the biggest in italy that means the biggest uh, office of the european patent organization that uh, uh, sits in munich in germany 
And uh, again, we give a lot of services uh, and uh, knowledge. We share and uh, we transfer knowledge about uh, what is it IP. And IP is not only linked to the, uh, you know, usually, um, especially small companies think that IP is just trying to defend something uh, or through a patent. IP, uh, I say, is the grammar of this brave new world. Huh? Because uh, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, your business model. And uh, at the end of the day, the biggest part, the biggest innovation we are talking about is not uh, necessarily linked to a new product, is uh, linked to a new business model. And in many cases, the business model needs an IP uh, aware, let's say, uh, company. Because uh, if you want to license, to uh, make a, an agreement, a joint venture, you cannot skip this. I mean, but it's a different, uh, a complete different uh, way to, to make business uh, for many small entrepreneurs. Then we work a lot and we, uh, on competencies and knowledges because, uh, uh, needless to say, it's a brave new world in which you need a complete new set of, uh, of competencies and mindset. That's why we are an important uh, training agency. And uh, then we have some special let's say, services and spaces, in business incubators, to uh, support new business ideas and uh, startups. Yeah, here you have some uh, infographics about uh, where we work uh, on, uh, on uh, more detailed services. I will skip them, but uh, if you are interested, we can, uh, we can uh, maybe go in depth uh, later on. Uh, just just a final remark uh, uh, on this uh, example, for example, in this area, you see named uh, some very innovative technologies and services. Uh, we have a special laboratory on digital technologies, and, uh, but the principle there is to give access to small companies uh, through um, technologies, that digital technologies that they cannot afford to give access to them and uh, to help them understand that many of these technologies uh, are have to do with them. Even they are involved in traditional uh, industries and traditional businesses because digital is very pervasive. Uh, the huge stream of uh, Internet of Things is something very important for, especially for traditional sector. So this is also another, another uh, important remark I want to share. So I will go through these uh, graphics. So which are the driving in direction we are uh, now um, based on uh, our, in our daily work? You will find, and we never uh, talked before, many elements that uh, already uh, Louis said uh, in, the, in, in the previous page. To our eyes, uh, a competitive, even SME, uh, now must be global, mm -hmm. must turn to be global to be competitive. Mm -hmm. In this sense, innovation in SMEs uh, comes up with uh, uh, the so-called uh, open innovation. I have a, uh, a slide just to, if you are not familiar with the open innovation model that is uh, rather consolidated, but uh, basically says that uh, uh, the, um, the business model of the company must be open, not only, uh, let's say, looking for new markets, but also on uh, the sourcing market. And sourcing means not only the components you use for your uh, products, but also the knowledges, technologies, and uh, uh, services. So it's uh, completely open. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, another remark in terms of uh, internationalization is about the fact that uh, the, we live in a very uh, vulnerable, but also very uh, uh, ever-changing uh, 
continuously changing uh, world in which the traditional uh, moving of markets and looking uh, uh, western and eastern is totally changing is also very very interesting uh, looking uh, southern and uh, northern and that will show something and uh, the manufacturing especially you know well that in US President Obama launched some years ago the made in the US and by US and now we are having a return to manufacturing uh, uh, even in, uh, in Europe but uh, moreover Manufacturing has a lot to do with uh, uh, knowing the, the process, knowing the technologies, but, and not only the, having something that is made just in your courtyard. And this is uh, quite important because it uh, uh, has a lot to do with the, a cross-fertilization of elements uh, that comes from sociology, from uh, ethnography, from uh, different markets that are coming up very very tumultuously and uh, but also quickly mm. and the digital transformation mm. there are figures that are unbelievable on uh, uh, that uh, month by month show how the digital the so-called in the manufacturing uh, uh, is called you know, the industry 4.0 in uh, germany has been named like this is uh, rather changing also the way in which you um, integrate your value chain, your uh, supplier, uh, the way you manage your data, and uh, also the data that can, uh, can be uh, analyzed and used for innovative services, the so-called big data, uh, is uh, still uh, an iceberg and we can see nowadays only a very small part of the, of the tip. So which is the vision? Um, I mean, basically uh, the way in which the, the big trend of innovation are going uh, are, uh, should be oriented using also innovative technologies but not forgetting, for example, the, the, what, um, what was considered as marginal segment of the society, of the customers, of uh, the, the market. We know that now we have a plethora of instruments to reach customers, traditional customers, but also uh, not traditional customers. And so the so-called, uh, in the internet, word called uh, long tail, no? It's something that uh, is showing uh, a growing interest in terms of being uh, uh, a market for your products. So few customers, but well distributed that uh, at the end of the day be, uh, make a big mass of, of uh, customers. I don't know if you are familiar with the, the so-called blue ocean market strategy has been uh, uh, formulated some years ago by two Stanford uh, or Berkeley, I uh, can remember, uh, professors about the fact that there are blue ocean markets, completely new and uh, not explorer markets that are available and uh, these are, can be uh, taken through new technologies, uh, new ways to approach markets, new ways to uh, consider the internet. Consider that uh, in the last, uh, in one of the latest uh, reports from the Politecnico uh, in Milan about the use of internet for Italian companies, only 4% were considered sufficient. 4%. Sufficient means that use the internet not only to have some website pay pages or just to say something uh, about their products or maybe just to propose a kind of e-commerce. We know well that uh, uh, internet uh, together with social channels, with uh, many other ways to uh, interact with your customers, with your markets is a complete new world, hmm? still uh, unknown to many companies. The social, I was saying that uh, uh, it's, we know that we, we are living in a vulnerable 
world and the social mutations that are having uh, a, an incredible impact thanks to migrants and the immigration in the, the Mediterranean area that uh, is, has a lot to do with Italy in particular is completely changing some uh, balances in, uh, in Europe huh? has also opened up a uh, in, in different way to see things and social uh, evolution. Another, just to give you another example, uh, unfortunately um, this affect uh, uh, all our countries, uh, but uh, I mean it's uh, something uh, that demography uh, stated uh, since some years. Uh, we are an aging population, but this, for example, here in, a, in, a, in an, around Treviso, we have one of the major concentration uh, of uh, uh, the so-called sports system industry, companies national and international dealing with the sport industry. Consider that the aging population trend uh, is opening up a complete new market of, uh, because the healthy life and by luck, the, a longer life, uh, of uh, people over 60 that want to run, that want to ski, that want to m have a healthy lifestyle and sports. But you still uh, have a very much difficulty in find, uh, finding technical gear, uh, outfit, uh, shoes, uh, thought for an over 60 people. Hmm? So this opened up a complete new blue ocean market. So uh, intercepting the big social mutation is another important uh, uh, trend for innovation. And, uh, some, and this needs a strategic planning, a strategic research, even if you are a small company. Because nowadays it's not enough just to you know, compete on price, as uh, in many cases, uh, small companies made uh, in, the, in the last decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, another huge trend is about sustainability. And sustainability has a lot to do with the environment, but sustainability has, uh, uh, must be intended more uh, as uh, uh, economic sustainable. That means uh, the, to go to the, towards the, the cir a circular economy, uh, reducing the waste and valorizing any material energy process involved. This uh, uh, goes up uh, to the design uh, of, uh, of products, thoughts in this sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this sense, uh, let me say that uh, uh, the, uh, a global interconnected ecosystem favorable to innovation needs to have also some intermediaries like uh, uh, agencies, like uh, innovation and technology parks, uh, like uh, uh, cross-fertilization environments where these things can be mixed and uh, uh, regenerate the business model of, uh, of companies. Yeah, I can show you, uh, I mean, mm, this comes from uh, a European project we are, we are dealing with uh, on, uh, on possible, you know, uh, new segmentation of the markets. Mm. But this, I mean, if you look at um, the classes that are uh, uh, defined here for demand and for orientation to technology, uh, sounds a little bit reductive and uh, um, interesting, uh, but it's also on two dimension. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, the, the trend of innovation has much more dimensions, much many dimensions, and uh, so these uh, uh, must be mixed with all the consideration we have been made in so far. Well, and uh, I will give you just some example to, to finish my, um, my speech. For sure, just to uh, give you some example, these are, for example, in the, in the mass market, some consumption trends that now we, we can uh, highlight, we can pick up, 
And uh, I think that if you look to uh, each one, you can even find yourself huh? uh, in terms of um, as a consumer. I mean, mm, for example, we have been talking about the urban environment. We know that this contamination and this natural ecosystem for innovation uh, happen in urban areas. And more and more, there's a critical mass to be reached to uh, catalyze some processes. In this sense, uh, uh, um, urban areas are very interesting for creative. Richard Florida has been uh, remembered before. And uh, the creative enterprise, creative um, uh, and means uh, to mix, for example, cultural heritage elements like European uh, countries have uh, with the new technologies for new services and new products uh, happen more and more in urban areas. But you have to uh, better and uh, emphasize the, the, the quality of life, for example. So this has a lot to do also with the so-called uh, uh, urban regeneration. Uh, we all experience, I think, in our city that uh, there are a lot of manufacturing uh, sites that have been dismissed, uh, um, previous manufacturing plants that uh, need to be uh, refurbished for a complete new areas of uh, uh, a new kind of companies, in many cases in services. This is the story of many technological parks in Europe, for example. But this is, uh, has a lot to do with the quality of life. Uh, for example, in Italy, we experience the problem that we have a lot of uh, brain drain. But uh, uh, every time I uh, hear this problem, I say that the, the real problem is not the Italian brains go abroad. The real problem of Italy is that uh, we are not able to attract the, s the same number of brains from abroad, of talents from abroad. And this is the real problem. And this comes also from many elements in the urban and uh, in the quality and the attractiveness of life uh, in uh, uh, your city. That comes all, only, uh, not only from uh, having a good uh, university, but also having a good transportation system, a very interesting cultural life, uh, a very uh, wide bunch of services and so on. And this has a lot to do with policies, has a lot to do with the strategy also for the city and the country. So, and uh, you, you can easily understand how social dimension uh, is very important, like the uh, ethnography dimension, because I mean, uh, the mixing of populations and uh, different cultures needs also different uh, means, different needs. And uh, you see that in many cases, the role, in general, the role of consumer looking to these trends uh, is more and more proactive. We, we say, uh, probably you, you already uh, heard about this acronym, uh, the prosumer role, the proactive role of consumer that is more and more through socials, through interaction with the company that design uh, or give uh, direct feedback to the company on a new product. No? So in this sense, uh, uh, there are a lot of trends that are enabled by uh, new digital channels. Mm. But more and more, uh, there is uh, a convergence and uh, also the, the esti estimates about the, the co digital convergence, uh, so-called, that means uh, uh, having more and more in your smartphone uh, uh, several functions and things is something that is uh, just uh, in the very beginning phase. Mm. So, which are the key drivers for future business? You see here that uh, we have many things uh, that are coincident with, uh, with uh, has been told, uh, what has been told before, because uh, in many cases, uh, uh, the, um, the globalization is 
not only uh, being global with your markets, with your outland markets, but for example, acquiring knowledges and having, let's say, antennas uh, also for designing uh, your, your new products, your new ideas uh, in uh, uh, different markets. Hmm? And uh, for example, another in global trend, the scarcity of resources that is a problem can be a blue ocean. Yeah, uh, I'm going to, to finish. Uh, can be a very interesting way to innovate and to be more and to gain competitive again. So uh, this is the, the typical um, figure uh, that we've used for the open innovation model. Probably you are familiar with this. I, I will uh, not go through the, the, all the detail, but basically means that the, this funnel of innovation named uh, changed because you make all these holes. And so the typical uh, trajectory that was uh, from uh, internal technology database uh, to your current market uh, can have uh, many different trajectories. Hmm? And uh, yeah, this, uh, you see, to reach other markets to acquire, through acquiring uh, different technologies from uh, out your, the boundaries of your companies, consider that in many cases the company even never imagined to acquire technologies that have been uh, developed by someone else. And also, uh, licensing is a completely different uh, business model from the traditional business model in which the company was thinking, realizing, and selling the products. Hmm? Yeah, you, you can find the, the, um, some basic differences. Uh, I would say that um, also resumes uh, many things that I'm, I've been saying. But basically, the, the, um, the principle here is to pick up the best uh, from uh, uh, what is it. Hmm? Not uh, pretending that you have all the best resources, not you have the best technologies and so on. And uh, just to give you and to close with some examples. For example, look to this, uh, and uh, uh, this example goes also in, in the sense that uh, we have to look also uh, southern and uh, northern, not only western and eastern. This is a new uh, business center and building that has been uh, uh, realized uh, looking to a natural hmm, <coughs> uh, natural uh, principle, let's say, that is used by termites in, their, in building their uh, nest. Uh, uh, to face the resource scarcity, because in Zimbabwe there's a problem of uh, continuity of electricity. And in this sense, uh, uh, I mean, this uh, um, has been a very interesting innovation coming from scarcity. Hmm? Just to give you other figures, how we have been also wasting things hmm, about intellectual property. Look to these figures, it's unbelievable to me. And this is an underestimation of uh, a total waste of time, resources, uh, and money just because uh, small and medium enterprises were considering that IP is something just for big companies. And uh, make uh, a very good uh, so-called prior art search, so technology intelligence. Some of the databases are even open on, uh, on the internet. Uh, it's something that uh, has nothing to do with the uh, the decision of uh, to file a patent or not. I mean, it's a, a wide, uh, um, huge set of information, base of information that uh, uh, is available thanks to the internet, thanks to the, to the new technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, find, uh, to, to finish, uh, I don't know if you ever uh, uh, heard the, the so-called Juga, the innovation, mm -hmm. is uh, some kind of, in the US call it uh, frugal innovation. That is something that is, has a lot to do with the, all the things I've been telling to you. Jugada is an uh, Indian word 
So that means basically uh, to solve a problem in a frugal way, hmm? uh, to, so to face a problem quickly, in a way, in a flexible way, and uh, um, in, a, in a quick way. And this is one of the biggest trends. And uh, even India maybe has been considered marginal because uh, the largest part of the population is one billion and a half uh, of population uh, as a, a very uh, low uh, wage and uh, few, few dollars to spend. In reality, if you consider the figures, is one of the biggest today, one of the biggest market in the world. Hmm? And uh, just to give you a final example of Jugad, um, uh, Whirlpool, that is one of the major lead, uh, market leader in the world for home appliances, have been struggling uh, because uh, they are selling the washing machines in uh, India, and they have been working uh, five years to have a washing machine uh, that uh, is costing $80. And you can imagine, that now the washing machine is something that is, uh, let's say, arriving in, uh, in uh, India. But uh, they've been uh, really in a big crisis because uh, uh, another company was selling uh, a, the same target, let's say, washing machine, uh, costing $10 more and, but they were saying, uh, they were selling 10 times, and then $10 different is much. And at the end of the day, they understood the, uh, why. Because uh, the other, that is by a Chinese company, uh, was developed by an Indian engineer, and uh, that was facing the problem that uh, even in the biggest 20 million uh, uh, cities like Mumbai, the electricity is not continuous. In many cases, during the day, you have a shortage of electricity. And this uh, Chinese uh, washing machine uh, put a very, very simple uh, circuit that was uh, memorizing, was uh, a, a small memory that uh, was uh, keeping the point of the washing cycle uh, that uh, you, uh, you were when the electricity stopped. And uh, as electricity comes back, uh, uh, the, um, the washing machine starts again from the same point. The Whirlpool one, even costing uh, $10 less, uh, needs to be, uh, um, to be uh, have a button pushed back. Hmm? But this was a huge problem, because in many cases the people uh, was out of um, their apartment, so uh, in the evening they were coming back and uh, the cycle, the washing cycle was not finished yet with the big disappointment of people. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an, uh, an idea, you do not need uh, a washing machine with the 10 times uh, uh, of cycles, of uh, solutions, of, uh, in that case, uh, uh, it's a, a really a killer application, just put a, a few dollars circuit that responds to an incredible, an incredible uh, need. And uh, just think that uh, they are selling, they've been selling more than 20 million in one year of this washing machine that is bigger than all the washing machine sold in Europe and in US, just to give you an idea of uh, the margin, what is the marginal market. Okay, I finish here, but uh, I will be around, so if you need uh, some uh, information and uh, any question, uh, I will be happy to respond. Thank you.